Okay, when we start talking about the righteousness of Christ, uh, what do we mean? What are we referring to when we talk about his righteousness? And I think most people would say, well, you know, you think about the righteousness of Christ, we're talking about what is right in contrast to what is wrong about something. But then when you think about uh, the righteousness of Christ, and if you have an extra one there, I'll take one too. Uh, thank you. Um, you think about the righteousness of Christ, it's really, really important that we would think in biblical categories. And that's what this is about tonight as we begin to work through it. You can see there listed on your sheet uh, what it is not, what the righteousness of Christ is not, what it is and what it does. If you're watching online tonight, you say, I don't have that handout. If you'll go over to our church website and look on the messages page, I think it'll probably be the first one that pops up there on the, um, on the sermons page. Take a look at that. I think that you'll find uh, exactly what we're looking at here tonight as well. So when you think about the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it's important, especially in this week, we often refer to this as Holy Week, it's important for you and me to think about what's this really all about? Uh, we're coming up on a Good Friday. On Good Friday, we're going to be examining uh, a passage with this question in mind, what evil has he done? You have the two greatest justice systems, we think of all time, both the Judaistic uh, justice system and the Roman justice system, asking this question of what has Jesus Christ done wrong? And their answer is they can't come up with anything he's done wrong. Why is it important for you and me to think in these terms about the righteousness of Christ? Why is it important that he lived a perfect and spotless life? That's an interesting contemplation. I'm hoping that by my listing these verses here, you'll be able to take the time after this service is over tonight or sometime in this coming week just to really carefully think through it. So let's dive into it, shall we? What's right about this? A brief study of Christ's righteousness. In other words, if this looks right in God's sight, then what is it that's, that's right about this? One of the chapters that we looked at, oh, probably now five or six weeks ago, was Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel 18 raises some of the very same questions that you find in Ezekiel 33 and other places, where as the prophet is explaining God's righteousness, and he is explaining how when someone repents, when a rebel repents, that the Lord calls that person and actually puts righteousness on that person's account. And in Ezekiel chapter 18, people said, Lord, you're not being fair. And the Lord said, no, it's your, it's your thinking that is wrong. My ways are right. My ways are equal. So let's dive into it and talk about it. First of all, the righteousness of Christ, what it is not. Let's talk about what it is not, first of all. The Bible clearly tells us and shows us uh, with equal clarity, what is right and what is wrong. So notice this passage from Galatians chapter 2. This is the Apostle Paul talking, and you know about the letter to Galatia. You know that what people were doing was, after Paul had evangelized, after people had come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, that there were false teachers coming in and saying, well, uh, yes, I mean, yes, you're saved, yes, you're a Christian, but... You, there's really things you need to add into it. And what they had in mind was conformity to or bringing back in the Old Testament law. In response, look at the screen there and notice what the Apostle Paul wrote. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Now that, uh, that phrase right there, frustrating the grace of God, I think every one of us in this room would say, wait a minute, I don't want to frustrate the grace of God. How would I do that? How would I be a hindrance to the grace of God? The grace of God is his favor, his kindness toward us. Uh, what is the apostle saying here when he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if, note the word there, if righteousness comes by the law, then, catch this, Christ died in vain. Okay, here we are in this very special week, we are getting ready to celebrate not only 
the Lord's giving himself for us on the cross of Calvary, but also rising again. And catch what the apostle Paul is saying here in Galatians 2, 21. He says, you know what? If it's this way, then Christ died for nothing. Christ died in vain. I think every one of us here would say, whoa, that's, that's really, really wrong. But here's the question. What's wrong about it? What is it that leads the Apostle Paul to say, if that were true, then Christ died for nothing. Then Christ died in vain. And here's the big if. If righteousness comes by the law. Now think about what we're answering here. We're answering the question, what the righteousness of Christ is not, what it is not, and it is not righteousness that comes by obeying the law or doing the law. Wait, wait, it was the law not right. The law was right, and the law was perfect. Uh, the Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, verse 7 and verse 14, he said, the law is perfect, and I'm carnal, sold under sin. He says, the law is absolutely right in that it showed me what it was like to be a sinner. I would not have known what lust was. I would not have known what covetousness was unless we had the Ten Commandments. But it's very clear here that the righteousness that we're talking about, which is the righteousness of Christ, it does not come by the obedience to the law. Follow that down in your very next passage that you have there on the same page. Philippians 3.9, the Apostle Paul later uh, refers back to this very same idea. He's talking about his personal desire. Remember he said, forgetting those things which are behind. Remember he said, uh, if anybody has anything to boast of, then, then I have more to boast of than they have to boast of. But his whole boasting, he said, it's foolhardy, it's foolish, and it comes to nothing. But he says, here's what my earnest desire is, to be found in him, now catch this, not having my own righteousness, okay? So the next time somebody says to you, well, you know, I know what church people are all about. You're all about um, doing good things or trying to do th good things to get to heaven. All you gotta do is go to the scripture and the apostle Paul saying, wait a minute, no. It's not about me trying to figure out how to do good things. It's not having my own righteousness. I mean, that's, that's what he's driving at. Which, where does that come from? If you're going to talk about your own good deeds, your own righteousness, he says, well, especially in the Jewish sense, which is of the law, same kind of thing that we saw in the previous verse there, the righteousness that comes by the law. He says, my own righteousness, which is of the law, but, and here's what he really wants, that which is through faith of Christ the faith of Christ, the trust in what Jesus Christ has done, the faith of Christ, now catch this, the righteousness, he says here, which is of God by faith. And so it's not about trying to do good things that will somehow be good in God's sight. The Apostle Paul is saying no. He says, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is by faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's what we're talking about. Not, so if you're talking about the righteousness of Christ, this is what we're not talking about. We're not talking about the righteousness which is of the law. Now we'll come back to that in just a moment, but look at the way he says it in Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. We ask the question at the outset here, what's right about this? Why is this right? Well, it comes down to the word here, in his sight. That is, in whose sight? In God's sight. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, therefore, by obeying the law, doing what the law says to do, and doing your best to try to live in conformity of it, Nobody is justified or no one is righteous in God's sight by doing those deeds of the law. Because why? Well, the Apostle Paul comes back to this in Romans chapter 7. By the law is the knowledge of sin. That's how we know that we are sinners by what he's done. We're asking the question here about what the righteousness of Christ is not. Let's go on and ask, secondly, what it is. If the righteousness of Christ is not 
obeying and, and working hard to do good deeds and live according to the law, if that's not what it is about, what is it about? And if you continue on there in Romans chapter 3 and look at the next two verses, after he told us in verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Here's what he says in verses 21 22. But now the righteousness of God, catch these words, without the law, okay, not using the law, that, that is manifested or that is revealed, or now we see it really, really plainly. Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. So the righteousness that we're talking about, again, it's based on faith. It's based on trust. It's based on placing your confidence in Jesus Christ. He says, which is by faith of Christ. And to, who, to whom is this given? Remember the way they thought about religions at the time that they were, you just kind of had your localized religion. This shows up, especially in Bible geography, that uh, some people said, well, our, our God is the God of the hills. Theirs is the God of the valleys. This came out in one of the big battles there in the Valley of Jezreel. We call it the Valley of Armageddon. And they said, well, you know, our God is the God of the hills. Theirs is the God of the valleys. Here's what the Lord's saying. He says, it's unto all. It's universal. It's worldwide. Unto all and upon all that believe, there is no difference. So he's talking here instead about trying to find your way by doing the works of the law. Instead, you're saying, no, I forsake all of those things and I place all my confidence in Jesus Christ. Why? Why would you do that? It's because he lived, when he was here upon the earth, he lived out a perfect spotless record without sin, no sin whatsoever. That's actually the righteousness that is applied to every repentant rebel, every single person who's a sinner who comes and cries out to the Lord for salvation. That's the righteousness. It's not as if God had sort of extra righteousness left over in heaven and said, you, you, well, you can use this if you want to. No, no, no. No, this is specifically the righteousness, the righteous perfect record that Jesus Christ put together as he lived here upon the earth, and then he now exchanges that with us, as we'll talk about here in just a moment. Really interesting couple of passages that go with this, because this helps us to understand the idea of how can righteousness be put on somebody else's account? While we were in Israel, we had a guide for a couple of days, and she is a very nice lady, Harriet, and I really enjoyed talking to her but as we got into talking about the gospel, she is a, a Britisher who is Jewish, and um, you know she just started asking questions, so we just walked right into the gospel and began to really talk about it. And she said, here's the part I'm really wrestling with. I'm wrestling with how is it that somebody else could pay the price for me? And this is especially remarkable coming from someone who is very well versed in the Old Testament and knows about the sacrifices of the animals in the Old Testament and, and knows the, the substitution that was made there. Catch the way this is said here in Romans 5.17. For by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Okay, Who's the one man it has in mind there in the first part of the verse? By one man's offense, death reigned. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Adam. So this is Adam here, Adam's sin, as in Adam all died. So for by one man's offense, death reigned by one, catch this, much more, they receive, I love this, abundance of grace and of the gift of, of righteousness. The gift, dear friends, the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. You ever think about righteousness reigning? <laughs> I mean, just ruling. That's, that's an interesting way to think about that. So think about this verse, for if by one man's offense death reigned, I mean, why is it that people die? 
Well, it's because of the original sin of Adam. We were all born as sinners. And anybody who says, well, you know, I just don't, I don't, I just don't think that's fair, all right? Try to quit sinning. And what you find out is your desires are just like Adam and Eve's desires. I mean, we all have that desire for control. We all have that desire for sin. If by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace. And it's just hard for me not to park on that and talk about this abundant favor of God. And what is it? It's the gift of righteousness which shall reign by life in one. Now, this gets especially interesting because look at the very next verse on your sheet. We're going here over to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Look at the way that Peter is describing this. This is where it really gets intriguing. Here's Simon Peter. He describes himself as a servant and an apostle. Remember, the word apostle means a sent one of Jesus Christ. To them that have obtained like precious faith. Now, isn't it interesting? He uses the word here, not expressed or even placed. He says that have obtained like precious faith with us. Here's a comfort tonight. The faith that you have in Jesus Christ is the same faith the apostle Peter has in Jesus Christ. Do you believe Peter's in heaven? Yeah, I believe Peter's in heaven. And the confidence we have is the very same faith that Peter had that took him to heaven. It's the very same faith we have tonight that have obtained like precious faith with us. Now catch this, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's not the way we ordinarily think about that. We ordinarily think of, okay, I placed my faith in Jesus Christ and and therefore the Lord clothes me with his righteousness. That is true, but there's more. Because what he's saying here, he's saying it's actually the righteousness of God and our Savior that's what gave us the faith. Don't think of faith as something, you know, where where you merely did your part, and that was sort of the answer. No, it even comes out in verses like Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Get it? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So do we recognize here that the righteousness of Christ is, shall we say it this way, the catalyst I mean, the righteousness of Christ is what actually enables, creates our faith. That becomes very, very powerful when you begin to realize it's the Lord who initiated all of this. He, he's the one who brought all these things about. Sorry, new microphone tonight, new microphone cable. I'm trying to figure out if I can get it adjusted the right way. That didn't work. Right, this way. Okay, how's that? Um, that's what really becomes really remarkable about this righteousness of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's where you begin to realize, you know, the righteousness of Christ is not merely a, um, a theoretical characteristic or attribute. No, I mean, think about what happened here in 517. Righteousness shall reign in life. You, you, you get the idea that this righteousness of Christ is a real, vital, energizing, enabling aspect. Because here, the, Simon Peter says, the reason you have obtained this faith, we talked about earlier that it was the gift of God. He says, the reason you have obtained this like precious faith with us is through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what makes every Old Testament passage really come alive. Whenever we're in the Old Testament, we have to be really, really careful not to preach what I sometimes call synagogue sermons. And that is sort of general uh, principles of repentance where you just need to turn. Wait. How can you turn? How can any one of us turn? How is it even possible 
that anyone could turn back to God. Someone who is a, a sinner and was born with sin and death reigning over, how is it even possible that he could repent? Well, look at what Peter's saying here. You've obtained this like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, that's the, that's the active enablement, if you will, the very righteousness of God. You can see this in uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse 6. It says, the righteousness of God, which is, uh, which is by faith, it speaks. Now it gets really interesting, doesn't it? What do we see so far? We saw that it's raining. The righteousness of God is raining. We saw back in Romans 5, 17. Here we're recognizing that it's enabling through it. We have obtained like precious faith. So do you get the idea here that the righteousness of Christ, it's, it's a real enabling, vitalizing, energizing work of God that he has done in our lives. It's not merely an after effect of coming to Christ, it is actually the way that the Lord brings repentant rebels to himself. And so he says here, the righteousness, which is by faith, this is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it speaks. In other words, you could describe your Bible as the words of faith. They, they are the words of faith. This is the righteousness of God being expressed through the scriptures, the words of faith they speak on this wise. And what do they say to us? They say, don't say this in your heart. <laughs> on, the, on the trip uh, here recently, I, I started meditating on um, the biblical concept of what do people say in their hearts. And one of the reasons was I was reading through uh, 1 Samuel, got all the way through 1 Samuel. As I read, I noticed that, that David did some really dumb things when he said in his heart, uh, you know, Saul's going to take my life. There is nothing better for me than to go into the hands of the Philistines. He goes to Gath. <laughs> Who's from Gath? Goliath was from Gath. What on earth was David thinking when he did that? This is the episode where he spit all, spit all over his beard. He acted like a crazy man. Uh, be careful what you say in your heart. We'll leave it at that. But here, the righteousness, which is by faith, speaks to you specifically and says, don't say this in your heart. Who shall ascend up into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above? You know, who's going to go down into the depths? Every time I hear somebody say, well, I'm on a spiritual journey. Harriet and I were witnessing to a young lady here a while back, and, and when she really didn't want to answer the question about her, sta her state with the Lord, she said, well, I'm, I'm on a journey. You know, this, is, this is immediately the passage I think of. When somebody says, I'm on a journey, Romans 10 is the first passage I think of. And because the righteousness, which is by faith, says, don't do that. I mean, don't, don't think about, well, it's like I have to go up into heaven or go down to the depths. He says, no, the righteousness, which is by faith, says the word is near you, even in your heart, the word which we speak, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, here's where, when you think about righteousness this way, speaking, righteousness of God here, energizing, enabling. Remember the story of uh, the man with a withered hand in the synagogue there? I'm, I'm almost positive it was at Capernaum. I have to go back and double check. But the man with a withered hand, and the Lord said, stretch forth your hand. Okay, how can this man with a withered hand, how can he stretch forth his hand? And the answer is, Jesus said to do it, and, and the power is in the command, and Jesus commanded him to stretch forth his hand, and at that moment, his hand became stretch forthable, okay? That's, that's the way to say it. How is it that it happens that when the gospel is preached to people with withered hearts this time, people who are far away from the Lord, how does it happen? And the answer is, it's this enabling righteousness of God when we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, again, what it says in Romans chapter 10, the word is near you, even in your mouth, the word which we preach. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And that's exactly the way that the righteousness here, which is by faith, that's exactly what it does. All right, let's, let's go on and press on since we started into what does it do. Let's go thirdly into the righteousness of Christ and what it actually does. Now here's kind of a fascinating study. We looked at this a while back when we looked at 
the uh, promise of Jesus Christ and who he is, and we talked about the character of God. Think about these words. Of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. Okay, there is first, first and foremost, that's the main thing we learned, wisdom and that wisdom here is expressed in righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We talked about, the night we talked about this verse briefly, we talked about the concept in uh, Hebrew thinking of shalom, the word that we, is translated peace, but it conveys far more than a mere absence of hostility. Shalom conveys the idea of wholeness or completeness. You, if you thought in terms of a full-orbed life or a full-orbed existence, that would be a good way to think about that. And this is what Jesus Christ does for all of us in his righteousness. He gives us this full-orbed life, wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In other words, it's all about him. It's not, it's not about us. That's why John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. It's really all about him. We're asking the question, what is it that the righteousness of Christ, what is it that it does? And one of the things is we, it makes us complete. It comes out in Colossians, we are complete in him, we would say. Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end. We could say here, we could use the word fulfillment. He is the one who fulfills it for us. Remember, he lived the righteous life that we should have lived. Christ is the, fulfill, the fulfillment, the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the question tonight would be, are you believing? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone, not something that you can do, not deeds of the law, works of the law, not anything you can do. Are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone? Here's the way it's expressed over in Romans 5.21. We're asking the question, what does the righteousness of Christ do? That as sin reigned unto death, how did that happen? Remember what we talked about a minute ago, Adam, Adam's sin. Sin reigned unto death. Even so, I love this too, might grace, God's favor, reign through righteousness. There's that idea again about ruling through righteousness unto eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hey, this is not merely about living life more abundantly now in this life. No, we're talking about eternal life, that the grace of God, the favor of God would reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Christ Jesus. Doesn't this become more and more exciting the more we think about it? Here's what it says in Romans 8.10. And if Christ be in you, what happens to you? Well, the body is dead because of sin. What does that mean? That means if you place your trust in Jesus Christ just as surely as he was crucified on that cross, you are now identifying with him that like as Christ was crucified, Romans chapter six, so in the very same way that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so you also, you also should walk in newness of life. So there's this twin benefit here, the righteousness of Christ. If Christ be in you, first of all, the body is dead. You are now dead to sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Wow. I mean, the more you work through this, do you, do you see why taking this sheet and, and beginning to carefully work through some of these concepts could really yield a lot of uh, precious treasure and just thinking about what the Lord has done? Let's do one more. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 11. We're asking the question tonight, what is it that the righteousness of Christ does? And here is part of Paul's prayer in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 11. He says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Wow, you talk about a shalom life. You talk about the, the full-orbed peace that we're talking about. He says that we would be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. Is righteousness just something that 
cry, that the Lord God clothes us with, that he, he puts on us, we sing all the time, his robes for mine. Is it merely a robe that he puts on us and we are righteous in his sight? No, no, there's, there's more. There's the enabling aspect. Remember he talks about in Ephesians, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. He says here that you would be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So dear friends, as we come into this particular week and we think about what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, I hope that this brief study of Christ's righteousness will sort of turn the light on about God's enabling, activating, energizing righteousness, which is not merely a theoretical characteristic. It is actually a vital principle that is at work in our lives. And to this very day, the Lord is drawing more people to himself. Let's pray together, shall we? And divide up for our prayer time tonight. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to carefully consider this righteousness of Jesus Christ tonight. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us to recognize what it is not, what it is, and what it actually does, even to this very moment in our lives. And Father, I would pray for all of us that we would be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. And Father, we will thank you for the way that you answer this prayer. We pray in Jesus' name.